everyone. Uh, thank you for introducing me. My name is Margarita or Margo. I am a graduate student at the Department of Geography at UBC. And for the past uh, six months, I've had pleasure working with uh, Ecotrust Canada is UBC Sustainability Scholar, and the core goal of, of the project I've been working on was to assess how we can promote equitable decarbonization in the residential sector in BC. And I'm thrilled to be here today and to share some of my findings with you. So to start with um, setting some context, as all of you probably know, um, British Columbia has legislated a emissions reduction target of 40% less emissions by 2030 compared to 2007's levels. And this is supposed to set us on track to achieving 80% by the mid-century. And to support the achievement of this uh, objective, they also set targets for individual sectors, including a target for buildings and communities of 59 to 64% less emissions by 2030, again compared to 2007's levels. So on the right hand side, you can see uh, the trend in residential sector emissions in the province. Um, that was an overall 5% decrease between 2007 and 2020. But as you can see from the graph, there's no really definite downward trend that we would want to see. And of course, buildings and communities in general encompass more than just residential emissions, uh, commercial uh, building emissions also included there. But the situation is not much different. They only have seen a decline of 9.9% in that sector. So to complicate the situation even further, uh, majority of buildings that are going to be around by 2030 and even by 2050 has already been built. So we really need to speed up decarbonization of and retrofits of existing buildings, including energy efficiency improvements and fuel switching. And at the same time, we have to ensure that decarbonization of, of residential homes doesn't disproportionately affect population groups that are already disadvantaged and also actively work works towards repairing the harms caused by institutional, cultural, and economic um, and, and historical injustices. So um, keeping all of that in mind, um, in today's presentation, I want to start with providing an overview of existing policies and programs for decarbonization of the residential sector. Um, I will then discuss shortcomings of existing programs, both with respect to equity and effectiveness. And finally, I will present some of the policy pathways to achieve equitable uh, decarbonization in the province. So starting with the existing policies. So there's quite a few policies and programs that directly or indirectly encourage energy efficiency retrofits and fuel switching in the province. The primary um, programs are rebates and grants as well as um, low interest loans, but there are also uh, tax incentives such as clean building tax credit, a provincial sales tax exemption on heat pumps. There's free energy savings measures for low income residents, but they are not, uh, the free installation are not very um, high impact measures. They don't often include things like uh, heat pumps or insulation. There's also a carbon tax, which is great, but the levels of it is not really sufficient yet to really on its own encourage a fuel switching or, or uh, energy efficiency retrofits. And finally, there's Energy Efficiency Act that does restrict uh, what products are available to consumers, but it still allows for uh, natural gas um, boilers and furnaces. Um, and then there's a couple of policies that uh, the province uh, has announced, including a ban on heating equipment with less than 100% efficiency by 2030, um, alterations code for existing buildings that is is set to uh, to be introduced by 2024, which would require buildings that undergo alterations to meet certain standards with regard to energy efficiency and greenhouse gas emissions. And then there is a uh, plans to introduce provincial uh, uh, property assessed uh, clean energy financing, which would provide homeowners with financing for upfront costs of the retrofits, which is then repaid through the additional charge on a property tax. But so far it seems that the progress towards implementing PACE in the province have stalled. 
So, um, existing policies and programs have a number of important shortcomings, as I mentioned, both with respect to effectiveness and equity. And I want to start by talking about some of the shortcomings uh, for the, uh, with respect to effectiveness. So, first of all is the unpredictable outcome. The main motivator for retrofits, as I've mentioned, is our, this retrofits, um, low, uh, low interest financing and grants. Uh, unfortunately, it's challenging to predict uptake of these programs, and even if the incentive level was to increase, it's really hard to guarantee that the certain emissions reduction target that we've set would be achieved. Another problem with, uh, with relying on these financial, financial incentives is that if they're not restricted to low-income residents, they tend to suffer from high level of free ridership. For example, Fortis BC found that two in five participants in their residential heat pump program have, would have installed the same appliance even without the incentive. And this is problematic for two reasons. First of all, obviously it's not cost effective, but it also has problems with regard to um, equity as it uh, just worsens inequality. Ideally, we want to see public money going towards helping low-income households and social housing to, to improve um, like the energy efficiency, to ensure better comfort, better quality of life, and lower energy bills. Um, another problem I identified is limited retrofit drivers in multi-unit residential buildings. Buildings under 600 square meters can participate in the federal Canada's Greener Home uh, Grant Program, but those buildings that are bigger have limited opportunities. Some may be el eligible for commercial incentives, but there are limitations there regarding their, um, like regarding meeting the criteria, qualify qualifying them. Uh, another issue is that there are still rebates being offered on natural gas equipment. Ford SBC offers, uh, offers them and they can still be found on a Clean BC home rebate search tool, which is just going to lead to more carbon lock-in. And related to this, BC Utility Commissions continues to approve new natural gas connections, which is again counterproductive, especially since renewable gas resources in the future are going to be limited um, and will be needed to decarbonize those sectors that are hard to electrify, such as industrial activities. Um, finally, as we have seen in the beginning of this presentation, um, it doesn't seem like residential emissions um, are declining in the rate that we would need to achieve the provincial emissions reduction targets. Um, as far as equity is concerned, there's also a couple of uh, problems there, a lot of important problems. First of all is that existing programs fail to encourage retrofits in rental properties. Uh, many incentive programs target specifically homeowners, and those that are, don't often require contribution from tenants or landlords. Landlords uh, often are not the ones paying the bill, so they might not be uh, interested in investing in those upgrades. And then tenants, even though they are the ones pay, paying the bills, they might not be um, sure for how long they're going to live in, the, in this house, or they might not just have agency to make the changes to the property. And there's no c policies currently in place that would effectively address this uh, split incentive problem. Um, Another issue is that available financial support for retrofits in nonprofit, social, and low income housing um, is uh, insufficient to cover upfront costs of retrofits, uh, which, which are high. And that just makes it uh, hard for um, these housing providers to, uh, to afford uh, the improvement in energy efficiency or fuel switching. Um, Next is that locking of natural gas systems that I have described before may worsen future energy insecurity. Uh, fossil gas prices are going to rise as a result of a carbon price or other climate legislations, and this will especially hurt low-income uh, residents who may not be able to afford to electrify at least until the end of the life of their existing appliances. And to make the situation worse, Ford SBC continues to offer higher incentives for natural gas uh, appliances for uh, low-income residents. 
Um, Another, another problem is that homes with um, poor energy efficiency and fossil fuel heating are more vulnerable to extreme heat and poor air quality. And this disproportionately harms uh, health of low-income residents who, again, might not have the resources, the financial resources needed to, um, to improve and to retrofit their homes. Um, and finally, low ambition policy and lack of accountability is unjust to equity deserving groups, developing nations and future generations. So there's two problems with this respect. First is that the legislated provincial uh, goals, climate targets, may not even constitute an equitable contribution to mitigating climate change under the Paris Agreement. But um, even aside from that, the province is not on track to achieving whatever goals we have set, which is just going to put more burden on equity-deserving groups and developing nations who are most vulnerable to climate change. And it also will burden future generations who will have to live in a hotter world. So having identified these uh, shortcomings, of course, question arise how we can address them. And to answer this question over the past few months, I've been reviewing um, programs and policies implemented in other jurisdictions across the world to promote equitable decarbonization, also reviewing academic and um, non-academic gray reports. And in this process, I was able to identify a couple of best practices and I've distilled them in six main uh, policy pathways that I would love to share with you. So first is natural gas phase out and zonal electrification. To achieve provincial emissions reduction targets, we need to um, like the, uh, the natural gas usage in residential sectors has to decline. Uh, biggest natural gas uh, provider in BC, Fortis BC, uh, likes to argue that they are able would be able to comply with emissions reduction um, like targets, um, even uh, like with with the use of renewable gas. But the supply of affordable and uh, affordable and sustainable renewable gas using existing technologies is going to be limited and should be reserved for sectors that are harder to electrify. So natural gas phase out should really be a priority for the residential sector. And this should involve, first of all, establishing provincial strategy for renewable gas utilization, uh, banning natural gas incentives, uh, banning new installation of all natural gas heating system and appliances, and uh, requiring provincial utilities to plan for deep electrification scenario that is most compatible with provincial targets. Additionally, Fortis BC should be uh, required to pursue zonal electrification projects. And I want to uh, jump into this last topic a little more and talk about zone electrification. So sometimes also referred to targeted electrification, as name suggests, involves um, organized electrification of houses in the like in certain area. It is. And it is not only helpful because of potential emissions reduction, but it's also important for equity. A significant problem that can arise with electrification is when gas demand falls, um, few, uh, fixed cost of maintaining a fossil gas infrastructure is distributed among fewer customers, which leads to higher gas rates and motivates more people to transition uh, to electricity. And while it may seem good on the surface, at least from emissions reduction perspective, the customers who are likely to be left in, in this, with this, paying this higher gas prices are low-income customers who might not have resources, um, financial resources to transition away. Um, so you can see this problem also in the infographic here. So this is the picture before electrification. And this is untargeted electrification scenario. And uh, in this scenario, 70% less houses are relying on natural gas, but the length of the infrastructure remains the same. So the customers will end up paying more. And when we talk about um, zonal ele electrification, it can really help address this issue. If we electrify houses in certain areas, we can decommission parts of uh, fossil gas um, systems and then the remaining customers won't be affected quite to the same degree um, cost-wise. 
This approach uh, has been uh, taken by one of the largest uh, gas and electric utility companies in the United States, Pacific um, Gas and Electric Company, and they have been conducting zonal electrification uh, projects since 2018. Um, secondly, second uh, pathway, and something that cannot really be overemphasized, is enhanced support um, for low-income and rental households. Firstly, low-income households should be provided with uh, free installation of high-impact energy savings measures such as heat pump and insulation. Programs like this exist, for example, in Nova Scotia or Prince Edward Island. And uh, secondly, it's crucial to update um, Utilities Commission Act to enable and require utilities to dedicate a significant share of their funds towards high impact energy efficiency programs, specifically targeting low income residents. Um, in addition to this, uh, to, achieve, uh, to achieve our uh, climate targets, it's also important to rely on some regulatory policies. So first, this may take a form of mandatory energy efficiency requirements in rental properties. This can help address the problems that I've discussed earlier where neither landlord nor tenant are really incentivized to, um, to pursue retrofits. But eventually, mandatory energy efficiency requirements should apply to all properties. The city of Vancouver has already started moving in this direction. Just last year, they approved a regulation requiring commercial and multifamily buildings to report their energy usage and emissions. And over time, they will be required to comply with um, emissions intensity and heat energy limits. Um, and the limits are going to decline over time. And we just need a similar regulation on the provincial scale. Another way to promote uh, retrofits is by um, offering one-stop shop services. So one-stop shops provide um, homeowners with a single point of contact, which helps guide them through the entire retrofit process. Uh, they can vary in their comprehensiveness. Some uh, one-stop shops only provide informational services, other provide comprehensive services, starting with, um, with the information consultation, contractor search, contractor hiring, and managing the entire process. Of course, the more comprehensive services are more impactful, and um, these services should be provided free of charge for low-income residents, but they may be provided to higher-income residents at a cost to um, generate some profit, or at least uh, uh, offset the costs uh, of administering it to low-income residents. And one-stop shops are offered in many jurisdictions across North America and beyond, including uh, Nova Scotia in Canada and Ireland. Another issue that uh, has to be addressed is that British Columbians does, don't currently have access to financing that would be attached to the uh, property meter rather than the individual. Um, this hinders uptake of retrofits among, um, among um, homeowners who may want to sell the property in the future or in rental properties. To address this issue, provincial government should require utilities to implement on-bill uh, tariff programs. In on-bill programs, utility company cover upfront cost of the retrofits and uh, recover the investment through an extra charge on the energy bill. And ideally, on-bill programs uh, should be bill neutral, which means that the savings generated as a result of retrofit would exceed or at least be equal to the um, cost that the additional cost that consumer is paying. And BC uh, government should also ensure that um, homeowners can access property assessed clean energy uh, financing. And last but definitely not least, our district energy systems. District heating system offers lots of benefits. They have high energy efficiency that inevitably result in lower greenhouse gas emissions. They offer lower peak demand and lower average heating costs. They can also use waste heat from industrial activities and electricity generation that would otherwise just be lost. And district heatings are most cost effective in uh, urban, um, densely populated areas 
and since BC um, it has one of the greatest in Canada share of population living in urban area, it could be a um, viable long-term solution to enhancing building decarbonization in these urban areas. Uh, of course, district heating development doesn't happen overnight, but there are several actions that the government could uh, take to uh, support their expansion, including requiring local governments to consider district energy in their planning processes, uh, supporting district energy system through building codes, and requiring district energy connections where available in the alterations code. So. Um, that uh, brings me to the end of my presentation. Here you can see the summary of all of the um, pathways. And um, I would want to thank uh, everyone who made this work possible, including University of British Columbia, Ecotrust Canada, Dylan and uh, Josephine. And I'm just going to return to this uh, slide and I'll be happy to take any questions. Mm -hmm.